Welcome to Terra Firma. My name is Will, and I'm going to talk to you about the Spiral Jetty today, which is a very well-known rock hunting spot in Utah for the selenite gypsum crystals. This one you see here is the one in the thumbnail, and it is enormous. Um, as you can see on the inside, there is this cloudy texture, and that cloudy material is actually the clay in which it grew in. You see, gypsum crystals are made out of calcium and sulfur. They're calcium sulfate, and they form by evaporation. You get the calcium at the spiral jetty from the basalt. Um, there's a lot of volcanic activity in the area from when the Yellowstone hotspot was passing through the region. As the continent drifts over a hotspot, it will cause new volcanoes and new volcanic activity to form on the surface, depending on where it is. The hotspot stays in place while the continent drifts. So the Yellowstone hotspot spot at one point was under Utah, and that gave us a lot of volcanic activity in northern Utah. Anyway, basalt is made mostly out of the mineral uh, plagioclase, which can be in the form of um, Labradorite, which is a lot more popular and pretty. It's a very flashy one. Or it can be in the two-phase state of albite in a northite. Now, a northite has calcium in it, while albite has sodium in it. And almost all plagioclase contains a certain percentage of albite or northite. Well, the uh, basalt at the spiral jetty contains high amounts of a northite, which is very common with basalt. And when a northite goes through the process of hydrolysis, which is in which um, silicate minerals break down into clay minerals, so the feldspar becomes clay. But in this process of becoming clay, it releases a free calcium ion. And ions don't like being alone. They tend to bond to other charged particles. This is where the brine of the Great Salt Lake comes in. The brine of the Great Salt Lake is high in sulfur. And this is because of the bacteria that live in the lake that like to emit uh, sulfur as a byproduct of, you know, like a gas. It's just when they're done eating, it makes sulfur. And that sulfur builds up in the brine. And as the lake evaporates, it concentrates the sulfur. And those sulfur ions that are in the water bond with the calcium ions released in the clay. So you end up with these calcium sulfate crystals forming in the clay once the concentration hits high enough. And it's really, really cool. This stuff is actually the same thing as like drywall or plaster of Paris. And if you don't believe me, you can actually get one of these crystals, put it in the oven at 350 degrees, and it'll turn white into a plaster of Paris type thing. In fact, I got pieces over here. This piece is called hemihydrate. So hemihydrate. It's when it still has some water in the structure. You see, selenite gypsum crystals have a lot of water in their structure. And as that water is removed, it changes consistency. You look at this, you can see there are still some clear spots. It's not all white. And that's why it's hemihydrite, because it's still somewhat hydrated. If you cook it further, you get this. Looks like I broke someone's plaster of Paris project, doesn't it? And you know what? That's because that's what it is. It turns into plaster of Paris. So you can turn this crystal into a white crystal of the same consistency with the oven. So that's kind of cool. Um, Anyway, if you look at these crystals, you can also see there are these lines on them. And those are important, and I will explain in the video that they are breakage planes and how those actually work uh, in relation to the crystal. Also, please note these things are extremely fragile. Your fingernail can scratch them. They will shatter easily. And they also make kind of cool noises when you rub them with your fingers. Also note they're really sharp, so you can cut yourself, so be careful. And 
now we're going to go to some footage of me out in the field at the spiral jetty so I can explain things further. Here we are out by the spiral jetty collection area. Uh, note that we're not actually near the jetty. This is a area that you take a left on the way to the jetty to reach. Uh, you can park here. Any point beyond here is no motorized vehicles. Uh, off to the right, we have this muddy pit here. This is quicksand. And you can get covered up to your knees or waist in here. And no, you cannot walk around it. So don't try going around it. If you want to get out to the lake, you're just going to have to climb over the basalt here. And head out to where people like to dig. Now, you can see all those holes. One, people need to fill in their holes. Uh, it's, it's not nice, and we're going to lose access to this area. People don't fill in their holes. And two, where everyone's digging out there isn't the best spot. You actually are going to want to dig at the end of the wooden piers. And I will be showing that area when I start my digging. Uh, as you can see, there's still a bit of snow. It's a little cold today, but... Uh, it's so salty out here that there's no snow out on the lake, so that's pretty cool. Alright, so here we are at the end of the wooden pier. Uh, looks like some other people just showed up. They might be looking for the crystals too. Anyway, uh, so as you can see, people are terrible about filling in their holes. And small ones are a nuisance. But there are some really big holes like the one over here that people really need to fill in. It's really upsetting the state and we don't want this area to become off limits to us. Uh, anyway, what you're looking for when you want to dig a hole is if you look on the surface here, the ground's a little squishy, but also if I go like this, you can see that it's clay and I can roll it up into a ball or whatever. It's very malleable. It's like a potter's clay. And that is what the crystals are in. So if you see dark patches on the ground, go ahead and like scrape it and give it a feel because it's probably got crystals. In fact, someone left some small crystals on the surface here. They can get up to plate size, but here's a really nice, well-formed small one. I mean, look at this. It's a little dirty, obviously, but it's a very thick crystal, and it's very, very cool. There we go. Look at that catch the sunlight. Anyway, uh, get to a whole dog here and get some more footage. And also, we're going to head over now to the tar pits. Take a look at those. Yeah, I walked significantly further. See the little red wagon in the distance? Then what we're collecting. This is one of the tar pit pools. And as you can see, there's lots of animal bones in it. Mostly like pelicans and stuff. Birds that got caught in the tar and died. Um, so this is definitely a hazard. Uh, if you've got like a dog or something... I don't let them near this. You know, they might get stuck, and that would be unfortunate. Uh, and it is goopy. Um, I had a friend stick his shovel in it, specifically my shovel, and now there's tar permanently on my shovel. You can see the center of the tar where it erupts out of the ground. It's got less of a coating on it. looks more fresh. Uh, don't walk into that. Um, this is one of the outer pits. It's not even the main pit. The main pit is somewhere down here further. And we're going to see if we can find that. Okay, so now I'm way far away from my tiny wagon in the distance. Looking for the main pit. And there's just no landmarks. And I don't have any signal out here. So it's making it very hard to find the main tar pit that I saw on Google Earth. So... I don't know where it is. It's it looks as big as the monument for the spiral jetty, but I think maybe we'll find it. 
the ground's starting to get super soft. As you can see, I'm just sinking right in. So at some point it's gonna get too soft and we won't be able to go further. I don't know if we'll make it or not. I guess we'll see. So we walked all the way, <laughs> you can't even see our wagon anymore, all the way to the edge of the lake. But look at this snow drift. It is so pretty on these mud cracks. Anyway, here's the edge of the lake. See what you've done to us, Utah? See what you've done? This is why the lake is shrinking. I mean, this used to all be underwater. It's really terrible. But on another note, it's kind of cool. Saw crystal cavity here. A little hole to pull into. Let's see. Nope, that's really solid. Let's go over to the edge here. Yeah, there's ice. <sighs> Great salt lake. This plant has had better times. Also, it's very thorny. Did not expect thorns. Pretty cool looking, though. Anyway, um, let's get that in focus. Anyway, can't see my phone, so I apologize if things are out of focus. Wow, look at these salt crusts here. That is thick. That's, they look like icebergs. Oh, this is awesome. Let's see. This is made out of lots of tiny salt crystals. Ew. There's all this floaty on the brine. Of the lake. I don't know what that floaty stuff is. Well, this is pretty cool. I feel like it's a mature Alaska, except it smells like your grandma's basement. So. Pretty stinky out here. So I don't know if this is like algae or like a natural oil that's on the water here, but it's pretty nuts looking. Pretty nuts looking, pretty stinky of course. But uh, I haven't found the tarp yet. Maybe we'll see it on the way back to the wagon which is a tiny red dot in the distance. Okay, so here is a hole we just filled in after digging. Uh, it was moderately productive. Here's a pile of crystals, all covered in mud, which is why people call them mud diamonds after all. Um, they're gonna look fantastic once they're clean. We got some better hull in the other hole but we just load it up into the wagon, so I'll try and get more footage of cleaner crystals. A new hole, and having my assistant help out with the camera. My assistant being my partner, Shelly. Uh, come over here so you can hear the noise. So you're gonna want it to make a noise much like this one. That suction noise, that means you hit the clay. Whoa, that was a big crystal right on the side there. Oh, there's... Oh yeah, I mean, there's a crystal. So here's a swallow crystal from the one we just got immediately. Um, there's probably some bigger ones. Oh yeah, come here. So you can see in the wall here, crystal on the there. Here's the edge of a crystal. I'm gonna need to put on my gloves because these things are sharp. But uh, this is what you're looking for. And the crystals, they're just super abundant and everywhere. I mean, and some of the small ones are really pretty too. All right. Oh, we've been working this hole for a while. Here's a tip. Make mud like piles so that you can easily push them back in. Uh, here's one I just pulled out that's a little more cleaner than the others. They're all over in here. As you can see, them jutting out of the mud. It's pretty cool. So this right here was our biggest hole. We pushed in our mud piles, and then we walked on it like this to compact the mud. 
try and restore it to similar to its original state. See how much better that looks compared to these holes. Like, no wonder the state has an issue with us making this natural landscape look like garbage. Fill in your holes. In fact, fill in other people's holes if you've got the energy. That would be great. So here we are. We are uh, back from the spiral jetty and we're cleaning the specimens and we talk about the proper way to clean them. Uh, one, you do not soak them in cold water. You get the brush wet so that you can brush it, but you're just going to, ha, huh, well, mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes they break even when you're being careful because they're very fragile crystals. Um, my sister actually has a better method for it. She has this water over here that's alkaline water. It's less, it's less acidic, less likely to break it down, and more similar to the gypsum's uh, chemical structure. So it's a good way to clean them. Um, never leave them soaking. Never leave them soaking, even for a few minutes. Uh, that'll just destroy them. Uh, people didn't know about that and put these in for a few minutes. And uh, by the time I came back to the room, they had all fallen apart. So, mostly that's temperature change. Yeah, and it, it, a lot of it is temperature change. So you the just got to be careful. Just the yeah. At the very least. yeah, but you know, with a little bit of cleaning, you get some really cool crystals. Some of them, you know, can be pretty large, like this one. It's not fully clean, but yeah, it's getting there. And by the way, that's mud on the inside of the crystal, so it's not like. Something I can brush off. Yeah, let's focus. There we go. As you can see, it's not on the surface. It's part of the crystal. It's the mud. It's the clay that it grows in, being captured inside the crystal. So they're very fragile. Some are more fused than others. You can see these lines in them. These are breakage planes, and the more the more lines and the more defined the lines, the more likely it is to break on them, which can be cool because then you get perfectly flat surfaces that are very shiny like this one. So it's not necessarily the worst thing if it breaks, depending on what you want them for. But and so there's I'm going to do a quick overview of the ones we've cleaned so far today of the crystals. Got some really cool ones, lots of twins. Uh, some of them are pretty reflective. You get these weird ones. And here's uh, one of the more reflective ones. You got a few that have some iridescence too. But uh, for bags, when you go out there, you're gonna want plastic bags to put crystals in. And then like, I use a cooler bag, this waterproof, inner lining makes it much easier to clean than like um, because that clay will just really get in there we've still got bags of crystals to clean and there is so many crystals at the lake i think they grow every one to three years i don't know the exact time because no <laughs> one's no one's verified but it's based on just average gypsum crystal growth times um where did my focus go